So in this lecture, I will present some applications of the law of large numbers. I will start with Shannon entropy. And so we'll start with a set A, which is a finite set of letters, say. So we have, I will present them by numbers, one up to R. And we have random variables, x1, x2, defined on some probability space, which are iid. And the probability that, so these random variables take value in A. So the probability that x1 is equal to some A, I will represent that by PA. And this is for A in my alphabet A. So we have a sequence of IID random variables. These random variables take value in a finite set. And PA represents the probability that one of these variables takes the value A. Now, with that fixed, I will define a new sequence of random variables, Zn. And uh, Zn is defined as follows. Well, let me represent by Pn a seg sequence, say, A1, AP. So here, A1, AP are elements of the alphabet, A. And P1, A1, AP is just the product from 1 up to P of, well, maybe P, it's not a good idea. So let me take another letter. Let's say K. Um, so actually, this is N from G1 from N. So let me repeat. So. Um, I want to define a sequence of random variable Zn. For that sequence, let me define pi n. So pi n depends on a vector, a1, a2, a n, where these letters are letters of the alphabet A. And how is pi n defined? Well, it's just the product of p a g for j going from 1 to n, where p, p are these probabilities. So this is. Um, my definition of Zn, or oh, pi n. So let, let me define Zn. So Zn will be pi n of x1 xn. So this is a random variable Zn, which at omega takes the value pi n of x1 omega up to xn of omega. And by definition of pi n, this is the product from 1 up to n of p, x, j, y. Now, well, my first observation is that if I define um, by log of zn, so if I take the log of Zn of omega, what I get is that, well, I have the log of the product, so that becomes a sum of log of P of x, g, y. And now if I define yj as log of P x, j of omega, so this is yj of omega, this new family yj, it's again a sequence of iid random variables. What is, well, what are the values, the possible values of yj? These are the log p of a. So yj, y1 of omega, it's an element of log of p a1 up to log of p, the, the last uh, p1 up to pr. So the elements of a are 1 r, and therefore y1 takes value as log p 
of 1 up to log p of r. And the expectation of y1, well, it takes the value log p1 when x1 takes the value 1, and x1 takes the value 1 with probability p of 1. So this is equal to the sum of j going from 1 up to r of pj log pj. And let me call this quantity h. And this is what's called the Shannon entropy of um, this probability. So the expectation of y1, it's exactly equal to the Shannon entropy of this probability measure p. So let me come back here. I have that log z of n is the sum of these yj's. Therefore, if I divide log z of n by n, 1 over n log z n, it's equal to, by this identity, 1 over n, the sum from 1 up to n of log of p x j. And this is what I called y j. So 1 over n log z of n, it's the average of the first n random variables y j. By the strong law of large numbers, these variables y j are i d. So by the strong law of large numbers, this average converge almost surely to the expectation of y1, which is the Shannon entropy of the probability p. So what uh, we proved here is that 1 over n log zn converge almost surely to the entropy of p, um, where, remember, zn of omega was pi n of x1. Uh, well, here is the definition. So zn is given by that. And what we just proved is that 1 n log zn is converging almost surely to the entropy, Shannon entropy of this probability p, which uh, it's giving the probability of each element of the alphabet. Well, this was just a remark. My uh, second uh, application will be about the neural process. So here, uh, let me consider probability space, omega f p. And on this probability space, a sequence x j of i i d random variables. And I will assume that these random variables are positive, so that the probability that x1 is larger or equal to 0, it's 1. So x1 does not take negative values. And well, that the probability that x1 is not identically equal to 0. So that the probability that x1 is strictly positive, that this is positive. And so once we uh, have this family of IID, I will define uh, by Sn the sum of the first n terms. And what uh, I wish to do is to represent this uh, sequence as a random sequence of points on R. So I started from 0. And let's say that um, here is the distance x1. So I draw a, a point at distance x1. So here is x2. And therefore, this point here represents s2. Here is s1. So let me define uh, s0 to be 0. So here is s0. Since um, one of these random variables may take the value 0, say that x3 is equal to 0. And in this case, s2 will be equal to s3. And then maybe uh, here is x4. And here is, therefore, the point s4. So we have a sequence of um, increasing points in R, s1, s2, s3, s4, and so on. And now uh, I want to, given 
this sequence define a function which I will represent by nt. So nt will be uh, the function defined as follows. It will be zero, so nt will count the number of points at the left of t. So up to s1, there is no point at the left, so nt is equal to zero. So let me draw it in red. So here is nt, and then at time s1, so I'm considering here that this is time, so n, it's a process indexed by time, indexed by time t, so it will be zero up to time s1. I time s1, it will jump by one, because at time s1, there is one point at the left of s1, which is um, the first point. Then you, it will be one, until you reach the point s2, which coincide with S3. So at this time, S2, which is also S3, there are three points to the left of this point. So the process will jump to three at this point. And it will remain constant up to time S4. And at time S4, well, there is, let's say that S5, let's say that X5, it's strictly positive, so that S5, it's larger than S4. So here, you will jump again by one point, and it will jump to four. So you see that nt of omega, so here, uh, you fixed an omega, you computed x1 of omega, x2 of omega, and so on. For that omega, you have a process, nt of omega, which I just described. So nt of omega takes value in uh, zero, one, two, and so on, which uh, I will represent by the natural numbers with uh, the element zero, n zero. So nt, and when is that nt of omega takes the value, let's say, m? So if you take a point here in this interval, it is um, its value of, the value of nt as I defined, it's three, and why? Well, because this point, um, nt, the value of nt at this point, this point belongs to the interval s3, s4, and for that reason, nt is equal to three. So this set corresponds to the set of omegas such that s m of omega, it's less or equal than t, and it's strictly larger than s m plus one of omega. So I leave it to you to check uh, this identity, but if you observe that in this interval, remember this zero is s zero, in the interval s zero, s one, and t takes, so between s zero and s one, and t takes the value zero. And this is less so equal, so uh, its value at zero, it's zero, and its value as s1, you jumped. I want the function nt to be right continuous. So at s1, its value is not zero anymore, but it's now one because um, in the interval closed at the left and open at the right, nt now it's equal to one in this interval. And so you see here, because, well, since x2 is equal, x3, it's equal to zero, s2 is equal to s3. So any point in this interval, it's between s3 and s4, and therefore its value is equal to three. And this is exactly what we have here in this interval by my construction, nt is equal to three. So this is the definition of nt. Uh, we will define nt to be m in the interval sm closed at the left-hand side and sm plus one open at the right-hand side. So this is my definition of nnt. You can check that my construction corresponds exactly to this definition. So um, we could proceed in the other way, just define nt in this formula and construct the process, but I think it's 
easier to understand what uh, we want by uh, giving you an informal construction of the process and then give you uh, the formal uh, definition of NT. So here is the definition of NT. And now if I take the union, let me take the union from M equal to uh, zero up to, let's say, N minus one of these events. So if I take that, so take the union here on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of this union, I just uh, write down the result. So this tells me that the union of these sets for M in this range is uh, the event that NT of omega it's less than M, than N, sorry. Right, NT takes only integer values. So if I take the union from zero to N minus one, I get the set that NT, it's less or equal than N minus one. Since NT takes only integer values, this set corresponds to the set NT strictly smaller than N. And here, of course, when I run that, I mean that the sets of omega such that NT of omega is less than N. So this is the left hand. So let's see uh, what happens at the right hand side. At the right hand side, what I'm taking here are uh, these intervals. So the interval 0, S1, union the interval S1, S2, until the last interval, which is n minus 1, n. So this, if I take the unions of these sets, what I get is that t is less than S n of omega. So this is a second identity, which will be uh, very useful in the analysis of NT. So what I will do in the next uh, few minutes is to investigate the behavior of this process, which is now very interesting because we have, for the first time in these lectures, a process which is indexed by a continuous variable, NT. And let me just um, mention, so this, it's called a renewal process because you see that if you look at the process at time S1, you start it again. So at this time, you, are, you can think that this is zero and what you see, it's exactly the same process as you constructed from uh, time zero. So at any of these times, you can say that, uh, well, the process now is starting at this time at this value zero and what you observe in the future, it's exactly a copy of what we, you had before. So in this time, at each of these times, at each of these renewal times, what you see, it's a new uh, reproduction of the original process. And uh, let me mention that if these random variables, if the random variables are distributed according to an exponential law with some parameter lambda, then this process, it's called the Poisson process of parameter lambda, which is a um, well, very important process, which will be um, studied later in, in these lectures in, on many occasions. So up to now, I started with an IID random variable satisfying these two conditions, and I defined this uh, new process which is now indexed by a continuous variable t large or equal to zero. And as I said, I want, starting from these two identities, investigate the behavior of this process. So uh, here I kept the definition of Sn and here uh, the definition of Nt. So my first claim about this process is that nt converge to plus infinity almost surely. So you see that uh, the way at which we defined nt, it's an increasing process. So ns of omega, it's less or equal than nt of omega if s, it's less or equal than t. So I leave it to you uh, to check from um, this definition that indeed nt it's a non well it's an increasing function a non decreasing function now i wish to prove that st um, converge to plus infinity almost surely so what uh, we need to prove 
it's that the, with probability one, the supremum of nt, it's equal to plus infinity. Or, which is the same way, the same thing, is that the probability that the supremum of nt to be finite, that this has probability zero. And, well, this set, it's equal to the limit as m increased to plus infinity that the probability of the supremum of t and t is less or equal than m. Right? So uh, this, as m increase, it's a sequence of increasing sets. And it's converging its union. It's given by um, this set. Therefore, the probability of this set, it's equal to that limit. So we have to show, actually, that this limit is equal to 0 for all m. So let's, fi let's fix m. And what we want to prove is that uh, this set has now what we want to well, let me write it here. What we want to prove is that the probability that the supremum of t larger or equal than 0 of nt is less or equal than m. Well, but if the supremum of nt is less or equal than 0, then, so this set here, it's contained in the set nt less or equal than m. Right? If the supremum nt is bounded by m, then clearly nt, which is smaller than the set, it's also less or equal than m. So this probability, it's less or equal than the probability that nt, it's less or equal than m. Now, if we look at this, we can represent that in terms of Sn. So this is the same thing as the probability that nt is less than m. Let me take, let me assume that m belongs to n. Let me write this less or equal than m as less than m plus 1. And now let's use this identity to say that this is the probability that sm plus 1, which is x1 plus x m plus 1, that this is larger than t. Right? <coughs> so um, by this identity, n t less than m plus 1, it's equal to s m plus 1 larger than t. X, s m plus 1, it's the sum of x1 up to x m. Well, so this is true uh, for, so remember here we fixed m, and let's say that we fixed m an integer value, and this is true for all t. This probability is bounded by that for all t, but this one is equal to that one, therefore this probability is bounded by this one for all t. So I can send t to infinity, to say that as t goes to infinity, this probability converges to the probability that x1 plus xm plus 1 is equal to plus infinity. So we just proved that if the, well, the supremum of nt is less than m, this means that x1 plus xm plus 1, it's uh, equal to plus infinity, or that the probability of this event, it's bounded by this probability. And this probability is equal to 0, because the uh, x1, x2 are random variables, so they take only finite values. So if this sum is equal to infinity, this means that at least one of them should be equal to uh, plus infinity, and the probability that one of them is equal to plus infinity is 0. So, since this probability is bounded by this one, 
we have that the prob this probability is zero, and this is exactly uh, what we wanted to prove. So um, we proved claim one, which means that uh, nt converge to plus infinity almost surely. So I wrote here uh, what we just proved, that nt converge to plus infinity almost surely as t goes to infinity. Now let's prove the second claim. And um, the second claim tells me that s n of t divided by n of t, so that this converge. So <coughs> see, let me call m the expectation of x1. This expectation is strictly positive because x1 takes a strictly positive value with strictly positive probability. So m, it's strictly positive, but it can be plus infinity. Um, I have no condition here which uh, ensure that m is finite. So let me represent by m this expectation, and this expectation belongs to the interval 0 plus infinity, including the value plus infinity. So let me call this expectation by m, and what I claim is that as t converge to plus infinity, s and t divided by nt converge to m almost surely. So <coughs> let's prove that. My first observation is that, well, I know already that nt converge to plus infinity almost surely. So this means that there exists a set omega 1 in the sigma algebra f, such that the probability of omega 1 is 1. And for each omega in omega 1, nt of omega converge to plus infinity when t increases to plus infinity. So this is uh, what we proved in the first claim. Now we also have by the strong law of large numbers that s of n divided by n, remember s n is the sum of the first n terms, that this converge almost surely to m, even in the case in which m takes the value plus infinity. So here uh, we have a set omega 2 uh, such that its probability, so omega 2 belongs to the sigma algebra, its probability is equal to 1. And if I take omega in omega 2, I know that Sn of omega divided by n, that this converge to m. So now <coughs> let's take, let's define omega 0 as the intersection of omega 1 and omega 2. Of course, omega 0 is an element of the sigma algebra because omega 1 and omega 2 belongs to the sigma algebra. And the probability of omega 0 is equal to 1. Now I claim that s and t divided by nt converge to m if I take omega in omega 0. So let's fix omega in omega 0. And uh, let's make the following observation. If I have a sequence a n, and a n here will be s n of omega divided by n, which converge to m. And if I have uh, nt, so a n converge to m as n converge to plus infinity. And now I have n t, which takes only integer values, and n t converge to plus infinity as t goes to infinity. Then it's clear that if I consider the sequence a n t, this sequence converge to m as t goes to infinity. Right? Because as t goes to infinity, n t goes to infinity, and t takes integer values, and therefore a and t converge to m because a n is converging to m. So, well, I guess this is clear. I leave it to you as an exercise to, to show that. And if I apply um, these two properties to the sequence, if I take a n as s n divided by n, what uh, this observation tells me is that So let me take, so this tells me that S of n omega, and I'm replacing now n by nt of omega, 
tells me that S omega computed at nt omega divided by nt of omega, that this is converging to L. And this is exactly what we claimed, right? We, show, we claimed that almost surely, so what we just proved is that for all omegas in omega zero, um, this claim is uh, satisfied, therefore this uh, sequence converge to M almost surely. So this is claim two. So here, uh, it's what we proved in the last step. Now, my third claim is that actually nt divided by t converge almost surely to 1 over m, where m is the expectation of x1. In the case in which m is equal to plus infinity, what this is saying is that nt divided by t it's converging to 0 almost surely. And in order to prove that, well, let me take uh, this identity. So nt is equal to m between um, sm and sm plus 1. So this tells me <laughs> these two sets coincide. So in this set, nt is equal to m. So this means that s nt nt is equal to m, so let me replace m by nt. So s nt, it's less or equal than t, which is less, strictly less than s nt plus 1. Right? These two sets are equal, so I'm taking an omega in this set. In this set, nt is equal to m, so I can replace m by nt and get that s nt, it's less or equal than t, which is less than s nt plus 1. So this holds uh, for all omega. And when I write s omega nt, this means what I wrote before. So let me just make it precise. So this is s evaluated at the integer nt of omega. So this gives me an integer value, and I compute s of omega at this integer value. So we have this inequality. So now <coughs> let me divide uh, this inequality by nt. And here I have always to consider that I have nt of omega, but I'm not writing it to keep notation as simple as possible. So let me divide this inequality by nt. And here, well, since I have nt plus 1, I will divide it by nt plus 1. I multiply it by nt plus 1, and I divide that by nt. So what uh, do we know? Well, we know that, as before, we have that s nt divided by nt. It's converging to m. So the left-hand side, as t goes to infinity, if I take omega in that set omega 0, which has probability 1, this quantity here, it's converging by my second claim to m. And if I look to um, the right-hand side, the first quantity, it's converging to m by the same reasons, while um, the second quantity, it's converging to 1 because nt is converging on this set omega 0, nt is converging to plus infinity, and therefore nt plus 1 divided by nt is converging to 1. So even in the case in which m is equal to plus infinity, this product is converging to m. So this product here is converging to m for all omega in omega 0. And that's it because, well, the right-hand side is converging to m, the left-hand side is converging to m, and this means, therefore, that t divided by nt is converging to m for this omega in omega 0, and that implies that nt divided by t, it's converging to 1 over m. Since this holds for all uh, omegas in a set of probability 1, this holds almost surely, and therefore uh, we proved this uh, law of large number for this renewal process. We just proved that, well, the number, the value of this uh, process at time t divided by t is converging to the inverse of the expectation of x1. 
So now we have proof that nt divided by t is converging almost surely to 1 over m. My claim is that if I take the expectation of this quantity, this is also converging to 1 over m. And so how we will prove that, we can try to prove it. You will see that, well, it's not that trivial. And the idea is the following. So let me give you the uh, strategy in order to prove that. And then I will uh, prove the claims of this strategy. First is that since um, if I call zt and t divided by t, we prove that this converge almost surely to 1 over m. And therefore, zt converge in distribution to 1 over m. Now, if we are able to prove that the expectation of zt square is bounded by some constant, let's say not for all t, we need that only for t sufficiently large, say for t larger than 1, then convergence in distribution plus a uniform bound on the uh, second moment allows us, we have seen that before. If you didn't, uh, that's a very good exercise. So convergence in distribution and a bound on the second moment gives you the convergence of the first moment. So zt will converge to 1 over m. So we have already uh, convergence in distribution. So what remains is to show that the second moment is bounded. So what uh, I really need in order to prove this claim is to show that the expectation of nt divided by t square, that this is bounded by some constant. So more precisely, that there exists a finite constant c0 such that this expectation is bounded by c for all t, say, larger than 1. And so that will be my next claim. And once we have this claim, we can apply this argument to prove that the expectation of nt divided by t is converging also to 1 over m. And here again, if m is plus infinity, this means that this expectation is converging to 0. So as I said, we want to prove that not only nt divided by t is converging to 1 over m almost surely, but also that the expectation is converging. And we have seen that in order to prove that, it's enough to show uh, this claim 4, which is that there exists a constant c0, which is finite, such that this expectation is bounded by 0 for all t larger or equal than 1. Well, in order to prove that, we will define uh, another process, which I will call n hat t, which uh, will be larger than nt, and we will prove the bounds for that process. So what I will do next is to construct a new process n hat t, which bounds nt. And for that, we will uh, use the assumptions on x1, this sequence of random variables x1, x2, and so on. So I know that this probability is strictly positive. But this, the probability x1 larger than 0, well, this set is equal to the union of k larger than 1 of x1 larger or equal, say, that 1 over k. If I take um, the union of these sets, I get that this set, since, um, well, these sets are increasing, so this means that the limit, so this, well, this is equal to the limit as k is increased to plus infinity of the probability that x1 is larger or equal than 1 over k. So this sequence of uh, events, it's increasing to this one, so its probability is converging to uh, this probability. And since this probability is strictly positive, well, this means that there exists a k. So there exists a k, strictly uh, finite, such that the probability that x1 is larger than 1 over k, it's strictly positive. So we proved that uh, 
uh, let me write it here, that there exists a delta positive such that the probability that x1 is larger than delta, which I'm calling, let me call that p, that this is strictly positive. Okay, so this argument tells me that there exists a k, and therefore there exists a delta, such that the probability of x1 to be larger than delta, it's strictly positive, and let me call this probability by p. So p is a number, a real number between 0 and 1. So this is my first claim. Now I will define a um, new sequence of IID random variables. So let me call x g hat to be, well, it will be 0. It will take only two values, 0 and delta. It will be 0 if x1 belongs to the interval 0, delta. And it will be delta if x1 is larger than delta. So you see, um, first, that this new sequence, x, j, hat, it's a new sequence of IID random variables. Because x, j, it's, I'm sorry here it's, I wrote 1, but actually I meant j. So x hat j, it's a function of x, j. These random variables are ID, and therefore x hat j, it's a new sequence of IID random variables. That's the first observation. The second observation is that if I take xj hat and I divide that by delta, this uh, new random variable takes only two values, 0 and 1. It takes um, value 0, well, let's say the value 1 when xj is equal to delta. That happens with uh, when in this event, and this event has probability p. So this means that the probability that x j hat divided by delta is equal to 1, that this is p, and this is equal to 1 minus the probability or that x j hat divided by delta is equal to 0. So x j hat divided by delta takes only two values, 1 and 0, and it takes the value 1 with probability p. So this means that these random variables, x, j, hat divided by delta, are Bernoulli random variables with parameter p, where p is uh, this value. So this is a sequence of ID Bernoulli random variables with parameter p. So this is the second observation about uh, these random variables. And the third observation is that, well, x hat j, it's bounded by xj. Right? So uh, because it takes only two values, it is 0 when xj is bounded by delta, but OK, so xj in this um, set, xj is 0, and therefore it's less or equal than xj. And in this set, xj is larger or equal than delta, so again, xj is um, so smaller or equal than xj, and this so happens almost surely. And so by definition of the sums, if I represent now by Sn hat the sum from 1 to n of x j hat, this is, of course, less or equal than Sn. So um, the sequence of points of hat, it's bounded by the sequence of point Sn. And therefore, if you remember the construction, it will follow the n. So it will follow, but I will show you. But if you remember how we construct the process nt, it follows from this bound that n hat t will be larger or equal than nt, where n hat t is constructed from the sequence of point s hat and by uh, this equation. So up to now, what I want you uh, to remind 
is that, well, this is a new sequence of random variables with this new sequence of random variables which satisfy exactly the same hypothesis of xj, we are able to construct a process as a sequence of points s hat n and um, renewal process n hat t by these equations. So this is uh, you have what you have to keep in mind. Then the, you have to keep in mind that these values, these random variables x hat j are very simple because if we divide them by delta, we get a sequence of Bernoulli random variables. And these ones are, well, are very well known. And finally, that, um, but this I will come back later, x hat is bounded by x, so s n hat will be bounded by s n, and that will give us a, a bound on n hat in terms of n t. So I kept here uh, the definition of x hat and s n hat, and in this uh, take, I want to um, introduce nt hat, compare nt hat with nt, and um, then give you an idea of the behavior of nt hat. So let me first define nt hat. So I will just repeat the same definition as we have for nt. So I'll say declare nt to be m, or nt of omega to be equal to m, if and only if s hat of m is less or equal than t, which is less than s m plus 1. And now uh, my claim is that n t hat is larger or equal than n t. And that follows uh, from this inequality. Let's assume that n t hat is smaller than, and let me use, instead of n, let me use m, or k. So let's consider this set. By this identity, which we already proved, we get that this corresponds to the sets in which t is larger, it's smaller than s k hat. Right, this is exactly uh, what that identity is saying. And now, if I use the fact that s, so this is not delta, it's s, that s hat is smaller than s, if I know that s hat is larger than t, then this is included, since s hat is larger than t, we know that s n or s k is also larger than t. So this is included in the set that s k it's larger than t. And now let me use uh, this identity again. And this is equal to the set it, at which nt is less than k. So what we know is that this is true for all t and all k. So let's fix the t. What we have is that n, if n hat is less than k, then nt is less than k. And this um, implies that nt is less or equal than nt hat. So I'll leave it to you uh, to check this identity. What we proved is that, well, if n hat t is less than k, then nt is less than k. This holds for all k. And I claim that, well, this implies that nt hat is larger than uh, nt. So I leave it to you uh, to check this last step. But this means that if I want to prove this bound, it's enough to prove the same bound for n hat. And uh, this is what we are going to do next. So um, we proved that nt is bounded by n hat. And now let's study n hat. So let me take here, it's a, a what I'm writing here is the sequence x hat j divided by delta, say. So x j hat divided by delta, we have seen it's a Bernoulli, so it takes only values 0 and 1. So let's assume that uh, here, so this is the value of x1, it's a 0, x2 it's 0, then we have 1, then let's say 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 
So this means that x1 it's equal to 0, x2 it's equal to 0, x3 it's equal to 1, and so on. So that's, uh, okay, let me write x4, x5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, uh, so this is uh, the values of x1 hat, and these are all hats. And I want, uh, from this sequence, construct nt. Now, to construct S nt, what we need is to construct S hem. So S0 is equal to 0. Now S1 is the sum. So this is S1 is equal to 0. S2 is equal to 0. Now S3 is equal to 1. S4 is equal to 1. S5 is equal to 2, S6, 3, S7 is equal to S8, it's equal to S9, which is uh, still equal to 3. So, and now S10 is equal to 4. So in our representation here, what we have is up to time S2, S0, S1, and S2 are all equal to 0. So here's S2. Now S3, um, it's equal to 1, but actually we are dividing by delta. So S3, it's equal, I wrote here 1, but it's delta, right? Because, well, I'm taking xj divided by delta. So you can see that actually when I wrote 1, it's, I meant delta, 2 delta, delta, 3 delta, and so on. So, S3, it's equal to delta, so here is delta, and that's S3. S4, it's also equal to delta. Now S5, it's equal to 2 delta. S6, it's equal to 3 delta. And this is the same value of 7, 8, and 9. And now S10, it's equal to 4 delta. So here, um, what is the value of n? So now n between the interval Sm and Sm plus 1, it's equal uh, to the value of the leftmost. So in this interval, nt hat, it's equal to um, S2. So in the interval 0 up to delta, and um, okay, so maybe I write it in white, until delta, we are in the interval S2, S3, and in the interval S2, S3, and it's equal to 2. Now, starting from delta, we are in the interval S4, S5, and this means that nt takes the value of 4. Now, starting from 2 delta, we are in the interval S5, S6. So here, the value, it's 5, up to 3 delta. In 3 delta, we, uh, we are in the interval S9, S10. So starting from here, the value, it's 9, up to 4 delta. So here is uh, nt and hat t. I just draw an hat. And what uh, I want to show you is that, well, I have here two zeros. And this is, well, this value. Now I have a 1, so I jump to the right. And now I have here, so in the first interval, there is a um, a difference in the first interval with respect to the other ones. So let's see uh, how much time I need to wait until I found the first one. Here is three. So this is how long I had to wait until to find the first one. 
And I took these three and I put it here, minus one. So I had two. Then I had here to wait for two intervals of time to find a new um, one. So this is this uh, jump. So I jumped here for two because I needed to wait uh, two times in order to find a new one. So here, I had to wait only one time to find a new one. So this is this interval. So here I have a jump of size one because I had only to wait an interval of time two. Here, um, it's three, but it's three minus one because, well, we are at zero and at zero it's slightly different. And now, at here we had to wait four and this is exactly uh, the jump from nine to four. So this is our jump here, a jump of four. So in, if we want to construct, so what uh, we have to observe here is that our process jumps only at the points delta, two delta, k delta. And how much it jumps will be determined by the length of time in which we had to wait to observe a one in this sequence of Bernoulli random variables. So let me define, uh, I will need a lot of space in order to define the objects which I want to define now. And um, so, as I said, what is important here is to count the number of the first appearance of a one, the second appearance of a one, the third appearance. So let me call these uh, times t. So t1 will represent uh, the time at which a one first, first appear. So this is the minimum over all k larger than one of um, such that x hat k divided by delta is equal to one. So in this uh, picture, t1 is equal to three because the first k for which x hat k divided by delta is equal to one, it's at time k equal to three. Now let me call um, t to the second time at which I observe a one. So the second time will be five. So this is uh, the minimum for k larger than t1 such that x hat over k delta is equal to one. And um, more generally, t l plus one will be equal to the minimum of all k's larger than t l such that x hat l divide, uh, k divided by delta is equal to one. So these times are the successive times at which a one appear. So in my example, t1 is three, t2 is five, t3 is six, and t4 is 10. <coughs> But what I'm really interested, it's in the length of these times. So what uh, I will define now, it's tau one. Tau one is just t one. So this is uh, the length at which uh, I had to wait until I find a one. And now I want to the second length. Well, but the second length, tau two, will be t two minus t one. Right, so t t one was three, t2 was five, so I had to wait two in order to observe a new one. And uh, more generally, tau k will be equal to tk minus tk minus one, and these for k larger or equal than two. So this is the interval of times, the length of times at which I had to wait uh, for to observe a one, and therefore in the first I had to wait three, then, so tau one, it's three, tau two, it's two, tau three, it's one, and tau four, it's four. So this is the definition, and I don't want to erase my example, so I'll erase everything else. 
what I claim is that this sequence that the sequence tau k for k larger than 1, it's a sequence of i, i, d random variables. So <clears throat> before I do that, let me compute what is the probability that tau 1 is equal to k. k here, it's an integer larger than 1. Because, well, you see that t1 T, tau 1 is t1, and t1 is the first time at which xk is 1. So uh, this is an integer, and um, takes only integers value for k larger or equal to 1. So when tau 1 is k, well, tau 1 is k if the first one appeared at time k. So this means that this is equal to the probability that x1 is 0, x hat 1 is 0, x hat 2 is 0, up to xk minus 1 hat is 0, and then xk hat is delta. Right? Tau 1 is k, if and only if, well, we have a 0 at 1, a 0 at 2, a 0 at k minus 1, and a delta at k. Now, these random variables are independent. So this probability is equal to the product of these probabilities. And x hat takes the value 0 with probability 1 minus p and takes the value delta with probability p. So this is 1 minus p, and there are k minus 1 terms, p. So that is the uh, distribution of the random variable tau 1. And this is called a geometric distribution with parameter p. So this is the distribution of tau 1. Now, what I claim, it's written here, is that these random variables are IID. Well, I, um, I leave it to you to prove it in full detail. What I will show is that tau 1 and tau 2 are independent, and the same argument applies to any finite number of random variables. So I want to compute here the probability that tau 1 is equal to k and that tau 2 is equal to j and prove that this is equal to, well, the probability that tau 1 is equal to k, tau 2 is equal to j. I claim that they are independent so and identically distributed, so that should be equal to 1 minus p, k minus 1, p, 1 minus p, j minus 1, p. So if I can prove uh, this identity, it follows from this identity that this is the product that tau 1 is equal, this is equal to the probability that tau 1 is equal to k, tau 1 is equal to j, and therefore they are independent, and the distribution of tau 2 is equal to the distribution of tau 1. So this is what I need to prove. So let's prove that. So when is, uh, what is, we have to express this identity or this set in terms of the variables x hat, because these ones are the ones uh, which we know are independent. So this is the probability. Well, what is tau 1? Tau 1 is t1. So this is the probability that tau 1 is equal to k. And what's tau 2? Tau 2 is the difference between tau t2 minus t1, but t1 is k. So if I want um, t2 minus t1 to be j, this means that t2 is k plus j. So what does that mean? That means that the first one appears at time k, and the second one appears at time k plus j. So this is equal to the probability that x hat 1 is equal to 0 until x hat k minus 1 is equal to 0. Now we have the first one at k. So x hat k is equal to delta. When I say 1, I, I guess you understood I mean delta. Now I want the second one to appear at time t2, at uh, time k plus j. So this is x hat k plus 1 is equal to 0 until x hat k 
plus j minus 1 is equal to 0. And finally, k x hat k plus j is equal to delta. Now, these variables x hat are all independent. The value, they take the value 0 with probability 1 minus p and the value delta with probability p. So I have here 1 minus p k minus 1 zeros, 1 delta. Here, from k plus 1 to k plus j minus 1, so I have j minus 1 zeros and 1, 1, 1 delta. So this is exactly what I wrote here, and it follows from uh, this identity that tau 1 and tau 2 are independent, identically distributed, and this distribution, it's a geometric distribution with parameter p. And the same argument, you see, you see it's clear uh, from this proof that the same argument tells you that actually the random variables tau k are ID random variables. So I summarized uh, now what we proved so far. So we have the sequence x hat j. With that sequence, we define s hat j. We want to prove here in red that the expectation of nt hat square is bounded by constants time t square. And what it's really important, what we proved, is that we introduced this sequence, tk, which is uh, the times at which x hat divided by delta is equal to 1. And what we proved is that if we define tau k as the difference of tk's, so the time between two ones, two consecutive ones, this is an IID sequence which has this distribution. So now I want to uh, draw again the picture of our process n hat t to see um, how this process evolves. So we started from 1. Remember that we defined s hat 0 as equal to 0. And then s hat k is the sum. It's written here from j from 1 up to k of x hat j. Well, x hat takes only the value 0 and delta. So it's, uh, z, it, sk jumps by uh, delta. Now, you see that s1 hat is equal to 0 until, so remember that t1, it's the first time at which x hat is equal to 1. This means that s1 hat is equal to 0, s2 hat is equal to 0, until the first one, which is different from 0, happens at time t1. So we know that t1 is the first time at which x hat is equal to 1. So s hat t1 is equal to delta, because, well, x hat j it's equal to delta, and it's, this is the first, t1 is the first time at which x hat is different from zero. So this means that s hat t1 is delta, and all the ones before, until t1 minus 1, they are all equal to zero, because t1 is the first time at which uh, x1, xj is different from zero. So by definition of t1, we have this, um, these identities, this sequence of identities. Then, well, the second time at which a 1 or a delta appear, it's time s t2. So s t2 hat, it's equal to 2 times delta. And between t1 plus 1 and t2 minus 1, they are all equal to delta because all xj are equal to 0. This means that s t1 plus 1 hat it's equal to delta. And this continues until s hat t2 minus 1, which is equal to delta. And then finally, at time t2, a new one appears. And then s hat t2 becomes 2 delta. And we can continue. So maybe, um, OK, let me write here a third column. So s hat t3 will be equal to 3 delta. And before that, so from time t2 
plus 1, this is 2 delta, until s hat t3 minus 1, which is still equal to 2 delta. So by definition of uh, t1, t2, and t3, this is, uh, we can construct, we can write all the sequence S1 and so on. So now um, let's see what this means in terms of n hat. Well, let's look at the first column. They are all equal to 0 until st1, which is delta. So this means if you take m, t, m equal to t1 minus 1, st1 minus 1 is 0, st1 is delta. So between 0 and delta, the process nt is equal to m, but m is t1 minus 1. So this means that here uh, I will write s hat 0 until s hat t1 minus 1, because they are all equal to 0. And then st1, it's equal to delta. And this means that in the interval s t1 minus 1, s t1, which is delta, and t, it's equal to t1 minus 1. So let's say that here it's t1 minus 1. And this identity is telling me that n hat is equal to t1 minus 1 in this interval, which is closed on the left side and open on the right side. So that's the value of n hat t between 0 and delta, because at the time st1 hat is equal to delta, and s hat t1 minus 1 is equal to 0. Then we look at this uh, second column, and we see that we have here s hat t2, and s hat t2 is 2 delta. And on the other hand, between t1 and t2, they are all, all s hat are equal to delta. So this means that here we go until s hat t2 minus 1. So now we look again at this equation. And we see that with m equal to t2 minus 1, we have that in the interval s t2 minus 1, which is delta, and s t2, which is 2 delta, in this interval, and t, it's equal to the index of this one, which is t2 minus 1. So this means that in this interval, until 2 delta, here, nt, it's equal to t2 minus 1. And we can continue. So let me continue up to time 3 delta. At time 3 delta, what happens? Well, the first one, which is equal to 3 delta, is st3. And therefore, between s hat t2 until s hat t3 minus 1, they are all equal to, de to delta. And again, I can look at this formula, take m equal to t3 minus 1, and conclude that between s t3 minus 1, which is 2 delta, and s t3, which is 3 delta, and t, it's equal to the index of this one, which is t3 minus 1. So in this interval, until that interval, the value of nt is equal to t3 minus 1. So now <coughs> we have nt. And what I observe from this graph is that we can predict the value of delta times k, because between in the interval 0 delta, delta 2 delta, 2 delta 3 delta, and so on, n is constant. And n jumps at these times. So I first want to say that if I want to compute n hat t, and here it's always n hat, I will write this as n hat t divided by delta 
times delta. So this is a real number. Since n hat is constant in these intervals, that will be equal to n hat. I will take the integer value of this real number t divided by delta and multiply that by delta. So I can represent n hat t as n hat of an integer times delta. So what I need is to have an expression for n hat k delta. Well, but if I look at here, at um, time delta, the value is at time st1, so at time delta, the value is t2 minus 1. At time 2 delta, the value is t3 minus 1. So again, here this is um, time delta. At time delta, so let's look at k equal to 1, time delta. What's the value at time delta? So let me maybe write it here. n at time delta, so k equal to 1, it's t2 minus 1. At time 2 delta, 2 delta, the value, it's t3 minus 1. So what I would like to prove in the next, uh, in the next step is that, well, you see that 1, 2, 2, 3, so that this should be equal to t uh, k plus 1 minus 1. It follows from uh, this picture that this identity should be uh, correct. And if this identity is correct, I will be able to express n hat t in terms of tk, but tk is, can be represented as a sum of IID random variables. So I will erase everything. I will just keep this identity, and I will prove this identity by using uh, this one. So this is the identity I wish to prove. So um, let's look at the set n hat k delta equal to m. So I'll just write uh, this identity. So n k delta equal to m. This is the same thing as saying that s hat m it's less or equal than k delta, which is less or equal than s hat m plus 1. And this is the same thing as, let's remember what s hat m, s hat m is. So this is the sum for k from 1 up to m of x hat k, or maybe k it's not a good idea, j. Let me divide it by delta. So this is less or equal than k, and this is less than the sum up to m plus 1, so I will write this as a sum up to m, x hat j divided by delta, plus x hat m plus 1 divided by delta. Now, you see from um, this strict inequality that, well, x hat m plus 1 divided by delta has to be equal, has to be non -positive, strictly positive, and since it, this x hat takes only delta or zero value. This means that this quantity, so I first claim that this quantity x hat m plus 1, it's equal to delta. Right? Because we have that this sum, it's strictly less than this sum plus this expression. So this expression is strictly positive, but since it's only zero and delta, this means that it has to be equal to delta. So we know that xm plus 1 hat is equal to, well, if this happens, then x hat m plus 1 has to be equal to delta. And on the other hand, this expression, it's larger than k. So the sum of these two expressions is larger than k. But this one, it's smaller or equal than k. So the only way for uh, this expression to be strictly larger, since 
uh, they take only integer values because now I'm dividing by delta. This means that x hat divided by delta takes only value 0, 1. If this is larger than k, and this is less or equal than k, this implies that this sum has to be equal to k. So the sum from 1 up to m of x hat j divided by delta, this has to be equal to k. Okay, because, well, it takes, this sum takes only uh, integer values. If the value, I know it's less or equal than k, if it were strictly less than k, by summing 1, I could not get something strictly larger than k. So it has to be equal to k. So this set is contained in this one, and it's clear that this one is contained in that one. Well, since it's equal to k, it's indeed less or equal than k. And since xm plus 1 is equal to delta, this means that this one is strictly larger than delta. So actually, these two sets are equal. Okay, we show that this one is contained in that one, and it's clear that this one is contained in that one, which means that both sets are equal. And, well, what is this set? This set is saying that up to time m, uh, we have k ones. The fact that this sum is equal to k means that we have k ones up to time n. And then at time m plus 1, we have a new one. So this is exactly the set that at time m plus 1, so we have, um, so up to time m, we have k ones. At time m plus 1, we have a new one. So this means that the k plus 1, the k plus 1, 1, appears at time m plus 1. So let me repeat. This means that up to time m, we have k ones. At time m plus 1, we have a new one. So this means that uh, the k plus 1, 1 appears at time m plus 1. So this is exactly the fact that tk plus 1 is equal to m plus 1. So these sets are all equal. So now if I look at the first and the last set, m is n hat k delta. So I can replace here m by n hat k delta to get that tk plus 1. tk plus 1, it's equal to m, but m is n hat delta k delta plus 1. And this is exactly uh, the identity I wanted to prove. So we proved um, that this identity holds, and now it will be very easy to deduce this inequality. So we just proved this identity, and now I want to go back uh, to this inequality. So as I said, n hat t, well, it's constant in the intervals k delta, k plus 1 delta. So I want to write this as n t divided by delta multiplying by delta. And since n hat is constant in these intervals, this is also equal to n hat of t delta times delta. And, um, so remember that for real number a, this represents the integer part. So this is uh, the maximum of all uh, n of integer n such that n is less or equal than z. So this is the integer part of the, sorry, it's not z, but a, the integer part of a real number a. And as I said, since we have seen that the process nt hat is constant between k delta and k plus 1 delta, you get uh, this identity. And this one, I leave it to you to check in detail that uh, it's indeed true. Now, uh, we have this nice formula, which tells me that, well, n hat k delta can be represented in terms of t. So this is uh, t of t delta plus 1 minus 1. And t, well, since tau 
it's given by the difference of t, and tau zero is zero. If you sum this expression uh, from zero to k, you have a telescopic sum, and what you get from uh, this identity is that tk it's equal to the sum from one up to k of tau j. Right. You get from these two identities that one. And so I will use it here to say that now that the expectation of n hat t square, that this is less or equal than the expectation of t t delta, but this is the sum. So this is a sum going from 1 up to t delta plus 1, tau j minus 1 square. Of course, well, these are positive real numbers, so this is also bounded by the expectation of the sum from 1 up to t delta plus 1 tau j square. And now let's expand the square to get that uh, this expectation is bounded. So we first have the diagonal terms. So there are t delta plus 1 diagonal terms. And the diagonal terms, since these random variables tau are identically distributed, this is the expectation of tau 1 square. And then we have the off-diagonal terms. And the off-diagonal terms, they are t delta plus 1 times t over delta. And since they are independent, the expectation of the off-diagonal terms are given by the expectation of tau 1 squared. And these two numbers are finite because a geometric random variable has moments of uh, all finite moments. So now, uh, well, it's easy to conclude. The integer part is less or equal than its value. So this is bounded by t delta plus 1. Let me call the second moment m2 and the first moment m1. So this is m1 square. So this is m2 plus, and by the same argument here, I have that this is bounded by t over delta plus 1, t over delta, m1 square. And so this quantity, if now let's say that um, t is larger than delta, this means that t over delta is larger than 1. So we can bound 1 by t over delta to get that this is bounded by 2 times um, t over delta m2 plus uh, this is bounded by 1. It's bounded by t over delta because I'm assuming, say, that t is larger than delta. So this is plus 2 times t over delta square times m1 square. And since t over delta is larger than 1, um, t over delta is bounded by t over delta square. So this is finally bounded by 2 times t over delta square times m2 plus m1 square. And this is exactly uh, the bounded we wanted. This is bounded by, indeed, a constant time t square. Uh, well, we proved it for all t larger than delta. t larger than 1 was enough. And um, that completes the proof that this expectation is uh, bounded. And therefore, we can, uh, since n hat is larger than nt, the same result holds for nt. And therefore, we can, since nt divided by t converge in distribution to 1 over m. And since we have a bound for nt divided by t squared by a constant, we can 
prove that the expectation of nt divided by t also converge to 1 over m, as we claimed. And uh, with this, we conclude this lecture.